If you feel comfortable with static routing, I then want you to think, I want to know how to marry my static environment with my dynamic routing environment. And that's where floating static routes come into play. Now, floating static routes means we're floating above the administrative distance of our dynamic default route. So we have to understand the administrative distances of our routing protocols first. So let's list them off. I'm going to I'm going to ask you to answer some questions here. You're not really on the spot. But what is the administrative distance of RIP? 120 OSPF 110. And then uh, EIGRP is 90 for uh, internal. We're not going to worry about the 170 for redistributed routes. What if you had your dynamic routing environment be the primary connectivity, but you had a backdoor where dynamic routing wasn't working, you had a backup route, a different pathway, that which is not part of the autonomous system of your dynamic routing protocol. What you can do is this. You can float the static route above. Now, normally, the administrative distance of a static route is what? That's a question for you. Static routes have a default administrative distance of what? One. Which makes that the most powerful because administrative distance lowers better, lowers more believable. So by default, what you'll do is you'll just merely replace the dynamic routing environment or dynamic route with a static route. And that wouldn't be good if the static route is pointing to your backup. So what we want to do is we want the router to have knowledge of the route, but to only use it if we lose maybe our EIGRP learned route. So what we do is this. We provide a higher administrative distance to the floating static route. And therefore, it'll only go in the routing table, because the routing table is what we will use. It will only go in the routing table when the primary route goes down. This is a very powerful technique. Let's say you have a primary and a backup ISP, and you want to install static routes pointing to each of them. Well, if you did this without any extra intelligence, if you provided the default administrative distance of one to each of the static routes, then you would in fact be load balancing. And that could be undesirable depending on the bandwidth situation that you have. Often your backup is not as fast, right? So you wouldn't want to load balance across each of them equally. That would be what was what is called pinhole congestion when you equally load balance on unequal pathways. Anyways, getting to the scenario, I want you to look at the administrative distance that we are supplying. The lower the administrative distance, the more believable. And we have the primary with an administrative distance of two. The backup, the secondary, if you will, with an administrative distance of three. So all of the traffic is going to go through ISP1 unless that fails. And if we lose that pathway, then our traffic will take a different route. Why? Because we'll have lost the pathway with administrative distance of two, up comes the administrative distance of three, and we have routing resilience.